Who or what do you think of when you hear the word prophet? Maybe you think of Elijah's contest with the prophets of the false god Baal. Some people pronounce that Baal in 1 Kings chapter 18. That's one of my favorite stories. It includes God sending fire down from heaven. And it was one of those stories that put fear into me because I figured if God could, put, could send fire down from heaven, I'd better be good. Maybe you think about the last 12 books of the Old Testament, all of which are named for prophets. Maybe you think about Jeremiah and Ezekiel condemning the false prophets who kept telling the king everything would be fine, while the Babylonians, who eventually conquered Jerusalem, were in the process of taking over all of what we call the Middle East. Maybe you think about the many Pentecostal and charismatic pastors who claimed to be prophets and were predicting that Donald Trump would be reelected, or the controversy that followed Jeremiah Johnson, who apologized for being wrong about that and then closed his ministry. Or maybe you think about Jesus, because Jesus certainly thought of himself as a prophet. He referred to himself as one in today's reading from Mark 6, which we just heard from Nancy when he said, only in his hometown, among his relatives and in his own house, is a prophet without honor. So what exactly is a prophet? In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul tells us that there are five different kinds of ministries, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Using Mike Breen's description of the different ministries, we might say generally that prophets are people who are given a word from God that they are intended to relay to others and that they often do so in creative ways. Many of the prophetic books in the Old Testament, for example, are mostly poetry. If Jeremiah or Hosea were around today, we might call them performance artists. They did some weird stuff. Some people have called Bono, the lead singer and songwriter of the band U2, a prophet. We often think of prophets as predicting the future, but it's more accurate, I think, to say that prophets brought a word from God that was a commentary on history. The prophetic books make more sense if we understand what they're relating to in the historical books in the Old Testament. As we mentioned last week, that prophetic word from God was often centered on the coming of the kingdom of God or on the need to repent. The Old Testament prophets use both of these concepts, but it's only in the New Testament that they occur together. Jesus calls people to repent because the kingdom of God has come. The call to repent in the Old Testament prophets was usually about either failure to worship the true God or about failure to care for the poor. In other words, failure to love God and love one another. In Jeremiah 11, 17, Jeremiah is prophesying to the leaders of Jerusalem before the fall of Jerusalem to Babylon. He says, the Lord Almighty who planted you has decreed disaster for you because the house of Israel and the house of Judah have done evil and provoked me to anger by burning incense to Baal. In other words, God is going to let Jerusalem fall because the people of Judah were hedging their bets and worshiping other gods. Maybe because they thought they were actually gods, or maybe just in case. But they weren't committed to worshiping only Yahweh. Or if you look at Isaiah chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, which are about the time of the fall of the northern kingdom of Israel to Assyria and Jerusalem almost falling to Assyria, we read this, wash and make yourself clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Or from Amos chapter 2, 
Just a little bit before that passage, that passage from Isaiah was written, probably about 40 years before the northern kingdom is conquered, we read, this is what the Lord says, for the three sins of Judah, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath. They sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. They trample on the heads of the poor as upon the dust of of the ground and deny justice to the oppressed. Now, some commentators believe that our society is going downhill because people used to listen to prophets, but now we only pay attention to whether we're making a profit. That's actually the problem that Amos was getting at. Amos was calling the people of the northern kingdom to repent from taking advantage of the poor for the sake of making a profit. The first part of Isaiah was calling the people of Judah to repent from taking advantage of the poor and from worshiping other gods. And both of these prophets declared that if the people didn't repent, God would allow the Assyrians to defeat them. The leaders of the northern kingdom didn't repent, and they fell to Syria around 700 B.C. Jerusalem's king Hezekiah prayed to Yahweh for deliverance, and the Assyrians withdrew before conquering Jerusalem. You can read about that in Isaiah 37, also 2 Kings chapter 18, and 2 Chronicles 32. If you put all of those together, they tell a really fascinating story. And then the southern kingdom fell to Babylon, just as Jeremiah had said about a hundred years later. But on the other hand, sometimes the prophet's word wasn't about judgment or a call to repent. Sometimes it was a word of comfort. The entire second half of the book of Isaiah, beginning with the words, comfort, comfort my people, in chapter 40, is written to comfort the people who have been taken away to Babylon, to assure them that God would be with them and save them, that God wasn't done with them, and God's kingdom was still coming. Because the prophets both called out sin and called people to repent, but also brought a word of comfort. We might say that the prophets both comforted the afflicted and afflicted the comfortable. Many of the comforting passages from Isaiah, as well as other passages in the prophets, were reinterpreted by the early church as foretelling the coming of Jesus as the Messiah, which gets us back to Jesus. Last week, we began a series on the topic of who is Jesus. We're spending six weeks following Jesus and his disciples as they learn who Jesus is and gradually come to faith. We can use that as a model for our own faith lives as we gradually come to faith and then gradually grow deeper in our, in our faith as we learn more about who Jesus is and grow in our relationship with him. Last week, we saw that Jesus' disciples first understood Jesus as a teacher. And his teaching had something of a twist, using images and symbols that the people of first century Israel would recognize, but giving the stories endings that people didn't expect, like cutting down a tree that didn't bear fruit, like only one quarter of the seeds growing and bearing fruit. Or the kingdom of God beginning as a small, seemingly insignificant and maybe even unnoticed plant, instead of with a grand gesture like marching on Pilate's mansion and driving the Romans out of Israel. In other words, Jesus' teaching had a prophetic twist. He wasn't just a moral teacher. He was proclaiming that the kingdom of God had come And he was calling people to repent, to think and live differently, just like the Old Testament prophets did. After Jesus finishes his teachings in Mark chapter 4, he and his disciples got into a boat to go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. In this story that might be familiar to you, a storm comes up 
and the disciples wake Jesus, asking him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Jesus tells the storm to be still, then asks, asks the disciples why they were afraid and if they don't have any faith. And then, although Mark doesn't tell us this, I'm guessing Jesus went back to sleep. And the disciples freak out. That's a technical term. They freak out, and they're asking each other, who is this? And I suspect, how did he do that? And they realize that Jesus is more than a teacher. Like Moses parted the sea in Exodus chapter 14 so the people could cross and escape the Egyptians. Jesus here exercises power over nature so that their boat can get to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Moses, by the way, was the most high-tech of all the prophets. You might wonder why that's true. It's because he used two tablets. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, Moses who got the people to the promised land but didn't get to go in, says, the Lord your God will raise up a prophet like me from among your brothers. You must listen to him. And he goes on. Some people would have recognized Jesus as the prophet like Moses, who had been promised by the Lord. While on the other side of the lake... Remember, that's what they were doing. They were crossing the lake in the storm. Jesus heals a man with an evil or an unclean spirit by casting out the evil spirits or demons, sometimes they're called. Some people today might see this as healing a man from mental illness. The point of the story is the same either way. Then Jesus heals a woman who had an issue of blood, a long-term hemorrhage that wouldn't go away. She was healed merely by touching his cloak and having faith that that would heal her. The healing might remind you of the prophet Elisha healing the leper Nama'an, whose skin condition made him perpetually unclean. That's in 2 Kings chapter 5 for you Old Testament scholars. And then Jesus raises a young girl, the daughter of a leader in the local synagogue from the dead. This might remind you of Elijah raising the widow's son in 1 Kings chapter 17, or the prophet Elisha raising a young boy in 2 Kings chapter 4. Now, some people question whether Jesus really did all these things. But it seems that Jesus' contemporaries believed that he did. All four of the Gospels tell of Jesus performing various mighty works or miracles or signs. We know that Herod had a conversation about what Jesus was doing. In that conversation, some people claimed that Jesus had miraculous powers because Jesus was John the Baptist raised from the dead. Others said he was Elijah, and others simply said he was a prophet. The distinction between John the Baptist, Elijah, and a, a prophet might be irrelevant to us. In any event, Jesus was perceived as doing what we might call mighty works or miracles. And that would be the perception because he was doing at least something like what was described in the Gospels. All four Gospels tell these stories with different details, but Jesus must have been doing this kind of thing or we wouldn't have so many different versions of the same stories, and his contemporaries wouldn't have thought that was the kind of thing he was doing. People like Herod's officials or guests wouldn't have been talking about it. Now, I know we live in a science-driven, materialistic culture, but just because science can't explain something doesn't mean it didn't happen. Think about the weather. Scientists are pretty good at understanding climate. Are we going to have an El Nino or a La Nina this year? Are there going to be more or less hurricanes than usual? That, that kind of thing. Will there be a drought? But scientists are pretty bad at predicting the weather, at least more than about 48 hours in advance. Now, does that mean we won't have weather three days from now because we can only predict the weather 48 hours in advance? No, of course we'll have weather. 
We just don't know what it will be. Jesus' mighty works, we more often use the word miracle today, were seen by some or by many of his contemporaries as signs of the long-awaited fulfillment of prophecy. God would send someone to rescue his people. Whether people saw Jesus as the prophet like Moses, the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy that the Lord would pour out his spirit, or maybe the fulfillment of one or several prophecies from Isaiah, God was coming to rescue his people. Healing people like the woman with the hemorrhage would be seen as the restoration to membership in the people of Israel for those who, for reasons of sickness or other reasons, had been excluded as ritually unclean. Those people who were thought of as sinners and not allowed in the synagogue because they couldn't comply with the purity laws. They were unwelcome, viewed as unclean sinners. Jesus' healing miracles bestowed on these people a gift of shalom, of peace, of wholeness. We might call it the way it's supposed to be to those who lacked that wholeness. He restored physical health. More than that, by restoring physical or mental health, Jesus restored people to community and to relationship with their neighbors. The unnamed woman, for example, would have been deemed unclean because of the blood. And anything she touched or sat on, or anyone she touched or who touched her, would have been viewed as unclean. But Jesus made her clean and whole. Similarly, touching a dead body made a person ritually unclean. But Jesus touching that young girl restored her to life. Jesus made them clean and alive. He restored wholeness and membership, participation in the community. The healing miracles restore those who are healed as members of the people of God. The Old Testament purity rules assumed that touching something or someone unclean made you unclean. It was contagious. But in Jesus, we see that being touched by the holy heals and restores. Jesus makes us clean and holy. All of these would have been perceived as a restoration, a renewal of Israel's covenant with the Lord, and part of what it meant to have sins forgiven, to be made clean, to be made white as snow. Many people in first century Israel would have recognized all of this as the work of a prophet, declaring and enacting, living out God's kingdom. The healings, and particularly exorcisms, would be seen as a battle with Satan. Or, as the, Old Testament, as the Old Testament might put it, the Satan. Jesus was at war with the powers of evil. The people of first century Israel thought that the Romans were the enemy. But the Romans were just a symptom Sometimes we make the same kinds of mistake today, thinking that people who disagree with us are our enemies. But just as it was 2,000 years ago, the real problem, our real enemy, is the power of sin and evil, what the Bible would call the power of the devil. Every one of Jesus' healings, every exorcism, every miracle was part of bringing the kingdom of God, part of bringing God's will on earth. Jesus was at war with his real enemy, the power of evil, and he won. When Jesus went to the cross on the day that we call Good Friday, it looked like evil had won. But Jesus reversed that winning victory when he rose from the grave. And his victory means we can have new life. Just as Jesus raised that little girl to life, you can have new life in Christ, in the power of his resurrection, connected to the risen Lord 
today. Just like Jesus restored people to wholeness, made clean those who their culture treated as unclean and impure, Jesus can make you clean. Jesus can make you whole. I'm sure that someone who's listening, watching today, believes that you're too far gone. You've done something in your life or something has happened to you that just seems like too much. You're not whole. Maybe you don't believe you're clean or that you could be restored. Maybe that you could really be part of a community. I have a voice in my head that tells me I'm not a good enough person to be a pastor. And you know what? I think it's right. Except for Jesus. Because Jesus can make anybody clean, including me. And he can give anybody new life, including me. He can make anybody whole, including me. And he can make you clean, he can make you whole, and he can give you a new life, too. The church is not a place for perfect people. It's not a museum for saints. It's a hospital for sinners, for people who know that they're messed up, who know that they're imperfect, but also trust that Jesus is the healer. Amen.